In this video, we're going to be talking about conservative vector fields. And in this particular problem, we've been asked to determine whether or not F, capital F, is a conservative vector field, and if it is a conservative vector field, to find some function lowercase f here, such that f is equal to the gradient of f. So in other words, that the vector field is equal to the gradient of some function f. The vector field that we've been given to work with is this here, capital F of xy is equal to y e to the x plus sine y times i plus e to the x plus x cosine y times j. So according to the question, there's going to be two parts to this problem. The first is to determine whether or not f is a conservative vector field, and the second is to find this function f. So talking about whether or not f is a conservative vector field, there's going to be a couple of ways that we can go about determining whether or not it's conservative. I think that the easiest way is to look at the scalar curl of f. If we can show that the scalar curl of f is equal to zero and that f is defined everywhere in its domain, then that proves that f is a conservative vector field. So let's talk about the scalar curl of f. We want the scalar curl of f to be equal to zero, and the scalar curl of f looks like this. We do the partial derivative of the vector field f sub 2 with respect to x minus the partial derivative of f sub 1 with respect to y equal zero. This is the scalar curl of f, and if this is equal to zero, and if we can show that f is defined in its domain, then we can show that f is a conservative vector field. So how are we going to find these two values here? Well, to find this first value here, partial derivative of f sub 2 with respect to x, what we're going to do is say the partial derivative with respect to x of the coefficient in front of j here. So we're going to say e to the x plus x cosine y, and we're going to find this value. Now keep in mind that sometimes, instead of the way that our vector field has been defined here, it'll be defined in a different way. So instead of having i and j in here, we'll have instead f of x, y is equal to, and it'll look more like a coordinate point. We'll say y e to the x plus sine y, comma e to the x plus x cosine y, like this. These two are exactly the same thing, and all we need to remember is that when we're finding this value here, partial derivative of f sub 2 with respect to x, we're going to be looking at either the coefficient on our j term here, or this sort of y value inside the coordinate point, depending on how our vector field f is defined. So we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to x of this value here, when we do that, when we take the partial derivative with respect to x, we're going to get e to the x, that's easy, the derivative of e to the x is e to the x. The derivative of x cosine y is just going to be cosine y, because this cosine y here, when we treat y as a constant, just acts like a constant coefficient in front of this first degree x term here. So we get plus cosine y. Now when we want to find this second value here, partial derivative of f sub 1 with respect to y, what we're going to be doing is looking at the coefficient in front of this i term or the x value in our coordinate point depending on how f is defined. Here instead we're going to take the partial derivative with respect to y of this value here, y e to the x plus sine y like this. And when we calculate that, when we take the partial derivative with respect to y, again, holding x as a constant, this e to the x acts like a constant coefficient in front of this first degree y term. So we just get e to the x. And then here, sine y, the derivative with respect to y, is just plus cosine y. So now you can see we have both values. This one is equal to partial derivative of f sub 2 with respect to x, and this is partial derivative of f sub 1 with respect to y, like this. So what we can do is say this value here minus this value here, what do we get? Well, obviously we can see that when we subtract this value from this one, we're going to get 0, right? e to the x plus cosine y minus quantity e to the x plus cosine y is equal to zero. So what we've shown is that the scalar curl of f is equal to zero. So that's the first piece. The second piece is that we need to show that f, the vector field, capital F, is defined on r squared. 
And that's really just about looking at these two values here, the coefficient in front of i and j. And just like any other domain, all we're looking at is points where these values would be undefined. So if we have a fraction and we can get the denominator equal to zero, then that would be a point at which one of these values would be undefined. If we have a square root and we can make a negative value under that square root, function would be undefined there. If we have a natural log and we can get the value inside the natural log to be zero or less than one, then that would be a point at which the function is undefined. But these are simple polynomial functions. This y e to the x plus sine y and e to the x plus x cosine y, they're defined everywhere in the entire plane here, r squared. So since they're defined everywhere, and since the scalar curl of f is equal to zero, that tells us that capital F, the vector field capital F, is conservative. So those are the two conditions that we want to show in order to say that the vector field f is conservative. We show that this was equal to zero, and we show that these were defined everywhere in r squared. So we can conclude that f is conservative, and we're done with the first half of our question. Now, given that f is conservative, we want to find a function lowercase f such that the vector field f is equal to the gradient of f. Now, in order to do that, we again want to look at the coefficients on our i and j terms here, and we're going to set them equal to functions that we call p and q. So the coefficient on the i term is always our function p, and if we have f defined as these coordinate values here, then it's the x value and the coordinate point that's equal to p. So we're going to say, p is equal to y e to the x plus sine y, this value we got here in green. q is always the coefficient on our j term here, or the y value from our coordinate point. So we'll say q is equal to e to the x plus x times cosine of y. Now before we go on, I want to point out that the way that we've defined p and q, and we'll always define them this way, p will always be equal to the coefficient on the i term, q will always be equal to the coefficient on the j term. All we're really saying with the scalar curl of f over here is that the partial derivative of p with respect to y is equal to the partial derivative of q with respect to x. So this same thing over here is the partial derivative of p with respect to y minus the partial derivative of q with respect to x is equal to zero. So we can also, instead of doing this if this notation is confusing, to check to see whether the scalar curl of f is zero, we can just identify p and q, take the partial derivative of p with respect to y and the partial derivative of q with respect to x, and then see if they're equal. If they're equal to one another, then this value minus this value will be equal to zero, and we can show that f is a conservative vector field as long as we know that it's defined everywhere in r squared. So that's another way to do it. But once we've identified p and q, we're going to change our notation a little bit here. And we're going to say that p is the partial derivative with respect to x of xy, which is equal to this value here, y e to the x plus sine y. So we're just changing the notation on the left-hand side. We're also going to say that q is the partial derivative of f with respect to y of xy is equal to e to the x plus x cosine y. So again, just changing the notation on the left-hand side. Once we have these, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the partial derivative with respect to x, and we want to get back to our original function f, not one of its partial derivatives. So in order to get back to just f of xy instead of the partial derivative with respect to x of xy, we're going to integrate this function with respect to x. If we integrate this with respect to x, it'll cancel out the fact that we took the derivative with respect to x. So integrating with respect to x will get us back to f of xy, like this, which is what we want, f. So integrating the right-hand side with respect to x, well, y we treat as a constant, so this is just a coefficient on e to the x here. So we keep y e to the x. And the integral of sine y with respect to x, this is a constant, so we just have to attach an x to it, so we get plus x sine y. And we have our integral there. The only other thing to remember is that we have to then add to this some function g of y, because this is like adding c, the constant of integration, when we take an integral. But we have to add this function g of y because we integrated with respect to x, and we have a multivariable function here. So we have to add this constant, which is actually a function, with respect to the other variable y. 
Now this is great in terms of the fact that we have a function f, which is what we're looking for, but we need to solve for this value g of y. We can't just leave our answer this way. We want to find a real value for this g of y function here. The way that we'll do that is now by, we're kind of going around in a circle here, we're going to take this and take the partial derivative with respect to y. When we do that, we'll be able to compare it to this function, the other partial derivative with respect to y. So taking the partial derivative of this with respect to y, we're going to get f sub y of xy, or the partial derivative of f with respect to y, is going to be equal to, now here's where the y drops away, we just get e to the x, because e to the x is like a coefficient on this first degree y term here x sine y when we take the partial derivative with respect to y just becomes x cosine y, so plus x cosine of y. And then the function g of y just becomes plus g prime of y, like this. Now what we can do, we have two different functions. Both are the first order partial derivative of f with respect to y, right? This left-hand side notation is the same as this left-hand side notation. So now we can compare the two, and you can see that they are both equal to e to the x plus x cosine y, except that this one has a plus g prime of y attached to it. If we compare those two together, if they have to be equal to each other, which they do because the left-hand sides are equal, since the left-hand sides are equal, we know that the right-hand sides have to equal one another, and in order for that to be possible, g prime of y has to be equal to zero, because there's no g prime of y term over here. If we had had over here on the, on the left-hand function e to the x plus x cosine y plus 6, right, plus some constant, then g prime of y would have to be equal to 6 because these terms, the e to the x terms match, x cosine of y matches, and we have no third term. But if we did, we'd set that equal to g prime of y. In this case, we have a plus 0. So we can say 0 is equal to g prime of y. Now, we have a value for g prime of y, but again, we're looking to solve for g of y. So we need to integrate this right-hand side to get to g of y. And when we integrate this, we're going to get g of y on the right-hand side. On the left-hand side, since we just have 0 over here, we'll end up with a constant, which we'll call k. So we'll get k is equal to g of y. Now that we have a value for g of y, we can go ahead and plug that back into our function for f of xy, and we'll get f of xy is equal to y e to the x, and I'm just copying directly from here, plus x sine y, and now here instead of plus g of y, we'll plug in k, and we'll say plus k, so this is just plus some constant k. And now this is our final answer, and we can say that this function f is the function that satisfies this equation and tells us that the conservative vector field f is equal to the gradient of this function f of xy.